chapter 16, beginning the story there at, at uh, verse number 13, it says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? 
Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not re revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The scripture this morning, I, I want to talk to us about a church on the move. Uh, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is in need of a fresh anointing, a new infusion of the power of the Holy Spirit, more than a, a, a slight uptick of excitement uh, with a passing revival, no matter how good it was, we need a fresh anointing, we need a fresh uh, day to day, we need God to touch us and minister to us in our soul. Uh, this hour that we're living in is critical. I, I believe with all my heart that Jesus could come back just at any moment. I, the signs of the time are greater than I have ever seen them all my life. I've been, ever since I was a little boy, I remember hearing the preachers preach about Jesus getting ready to come back. And uh, we were so, uh, uh, we held in our heart. We were, we were kind of, uh, oh no, you know, I, there was times in my own life I thought, well, I'll never get to drive. I'll never have, uh, never never get to marry, never have kids. I, I thought Jesus was going to come back that quickly. But we, you know, we, we plan in this life and we got to move in this life and, and, and just, just in case he doesn't. But we ought to have the expectation that Christ could come back at any moment. And now, as I stand here a lot older than I was when I was just a kid, uh, and, and I'm facing maybe a, the last uh, journey here before too long, I'm going to be going into my, my older years, my elder years. I'm th sitting here thinking in the middle, we are closer to the coming of the Lord than we have ever been in my lifetime. And, and I see things that are happening. People say, well, it'll come down the road. It'll come down the road. But I believe it's getting to the point that something's got to shake. Something's got to move. You can see it all around the world. And if you don't need to look far, just look at Israel and see what's happening there. Look at how the mistreatment of Israel is in our day, in our hour that tells us that something is about to happen. Something is about to erupt. Something is about to come upon this earth. Now, whether the Lord delays it or holds it back, I don't know. But I know that we see these things happening right now. And Jesus can come back just at any moment. We need Jesus to fan the flame of the Spirit. There's too much at stake. There's souls to be won. There's battles to overcome, there's hills to climb, and there's wars to be won. But the wars that we fight and the wars that we go through, they've got to be waged down upon our knees. We've got to get back to the closeness of God. We've got to get back to a revival spirit of prayer that God would move in these last days. I, I don't believe, I, I've told you this before, and I'll tell you again this morning before we get going too far. I believe that God has called us to be a church on the move. I believe that God has called us not to, I don't believe when Jesus comes back, the church is going to be limping in to glory. I don't believe that the church is going to be without power and ineffective when Christ comes back. He's coming for a church that has made themselves ready, washed themselves in the blood of the Lamb and ready for His appearing. It's not something that, that, that we're going to just limp in and make it in and, oh, my, we're just barely going to get in by the skin of our teeth. Uh, none of us are going to get there without the blood of the Lamb. Amen. None of us are going to get there but by His grace and by His power and by His mercy this morning. So we look at this scripture this morning as Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? You know, that's the biggest important question that any of us could ask is, who do we say that Jesus is? 
You know, some of the, the Muslims, they believe that Jesus was a good man. They believe that Jesus was a good teacher. They believe that, that he was a prophet in so many ways. Uh, but yet, when it comes down to it, uh, it's got to be the answer that Peter gave. That Jesus, He said that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. If we don't know Jesus as Christ, the Son of the living God, then, then we're missing what we need to have. We need to have him as Lord of our life. We need to have him as king upon his throne in our hearts this morning. So how do you answer this morning? Jesus said, I want to start with this point this morning upon this rock. He told Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. You can go back and you study and you look at some commentary that a lot of people believe that, that, that Peter was what he was talking about. Peter was he's going to build his church on, on Peter. No, he didn't build his church on Peter. He built it upon himself. He built it up on Jesus is the rock of our salvation. He didn't build it up on man. He built it up on himself. But he says upon this rock, I, I believe what he was telling Peter was, yes, upon this principle, upon my being, upon what I'm about ready to do, I will build my church. Tony Evans' commentary tells us this. In the Greek, Peter's name, name is Petros which means stone. But when Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church, he used the Greek word Petra. Petra was a collection of rocks knitted together to form a large slab. So how was he going to build his church? He was going to put himself as the foundation, the cornerstone, if you will. The Bible talks about that. I got a scripture verse here somewhere on that this morning. He's the cornerstone. He's the head. He's the foundation. But he's going to build it with you. And he's going to build it with me. And he's going to build it with a lot of other churches around the area. He's going to build it to reach out and to bring souls in to the, to the church. And make it the church. Make it the bride of Christ. David Jeremiah commentary states this. The Greek word Petra also means an immovable foundation. Don't you like that this morning? When you stand upon the Lord Jesus Christ, when you stand upon his word, you've got an, an immovable foundation. It's not going to shake out from under you. Uh, you know, the, the, there's been times this week, I don't know how this week happened, but I've been about 14, 15 foot off the ground in one instance, uh, uh, pushing 20 maybe and somewhere in there, but we... We were working on a deck, and then, then I helped my brother-in-law. We're 10 foot off the ground. Uh, time to take a blind back down and getting ready to put it back up. And, and I, I noticed that the shifts, if you're not careful, you're swinging up there by yourself. you got to watch what you're doing. It's a little shaky. It's a little unnerving. And you got to learn not to look down because you get dizzy. Amen. Yes. Anybody Amen. else do that? Amen. All right. It's a little shifty. It's a little shaky. It's a little scary. But you could stand and plant your feet on the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. And you can find that firm foundation. Nothing in this world will shake you. Nothing in this world can move you. Nothing can take away what Christ does for us. He gives us a solid foundation that we can stand upon. We don't have to worry about it. The world, the naysayers will come by and say you're foolish. They call you crazy. They'll call you dumb. They call you ignorant. They call you. You need something to lean upon. And yes, I do. I need Jesus to lean upon. Amen. They'll call you every name in the book. But when it comes right down to it, it doesn't matter because we're standing upon something that is true, something that'll last beyond this lifetime, something that'll last for all eternity. I'm here to tell you this morning. Christ and his word is not just for today. It wasn't just for yesterday, but it's for all eternity. His word will last. It's immovable. On the day of Pentecost, it was Peter who began to preach about this rock. He stood up and he said, you men of Israel... Acts chapter 2 verse 22 he said Jesus of Nazareth the man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs 
which God did by him in the midst of you. As you yourselves, you also know him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. You have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up. Having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. Amen. Death couldn't hold Jesus. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad of that this morning? Yes. Aren't you glad of that? Yes. Oh, I'm so glad of that this morning. I, I was thinking about this, you know. This is that same Peter. This is that same Peter that denied the Lord three different times. Uh, you are surely one of those that was with Jesus. I, I don't know who you're talking about. It got to the point by the third time it says he began to curse and to swear. I don't know who you're talking about. But when the Peter filled the Holy Ghost, the Spirit, it changed everything. He began to preach Jesus Christ. He began to preach and stand upon that rock that he talked to Jesus about the back in Matthew. It, it was that rock that he was standing upon, that firm foundation that he knew that Christ was the son of the living God. Just like it had been revealed to him, he had saw Jesus die on the cross. He had seen an empty tomb and he had seen Jesus again after the resurrection. And he watched him ascend back into heaven. And now more than ever, he was believing that Christ was the Son of God. David Jeremiah tells us that preaching Christ means to preach the person and the work of Christ. Who he is and what he has done. Peter began reminding the crowd of the miracles that they had seen during the time of Jesus' ministry on earth. Which proved that he was who he claimed to be. 1 Corinthians 13, uh, chapter 1, verse 23 says, But we preach Christ crucified, crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them that are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The world calls us crazy. The world calls it foolishness. There's people today that are looking for education, higher education. There's nothing wrong with that in context. Well, when people begin to search out things and, and look to things and, and they leave God out of it, there's a problem with that. Because God has the answer to everything. God has truth to everything. Even science has proven so many things that ha has happened in the word of, the word of God. Even science itself shows the handiwork of God. You can look at the stars. You can watch the, the galaxies and you can see the handiwork of God. You can look at our own lives and we see how, you know, how is it that your heart is beating this morning? How is it that our lungs fill with air? How is it that we're able to speak and how is it that we're able to even think? How is it that we're able to reason? How is it that we're able to have feelings? How is it that we move and walk? I'm not even really, I, I'm, I'm not even thinking about where I'm moving. Or I don't have to say, here foot, you go there. Here foot, you take us. I don't even have to think about it. It just does what I want to do in my being. How do we operate like that without a master designer? Tony Evans writes that the Corinthians were aligning themselves with human teachers against one another. As a result of their pursuing such a worldly way of thinking, sin was running rampant among them and they lacked God's power. That's what's wrong, I think, with the church today. I believe the church is in a weakened state, much like the church of Corinth. The church needs to turn from human ideas and human philosophy and human theology and get back to the Word of God. Amen. We need to get away from how everybody feels and how everybody thinks and this is the pu public opinion and this is the, the current uh, thrust of culture and this is what we are and this is what we need to do. No, we need to step away from that and get back to the pages of God's Word. 
I tell you this morning, a church that is, is going that way and a church that t tends to go the, the worldly route and tends to go the way of things the world is going and, and tries to include everything, I'm here to tell you, they're not going to have much success. But with Jesus, there's much success. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us this. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off, and to them that were nigh, for through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens uh, with the saints and, the, uh, uh, and of the household of God, and you are built upon the foundation and of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. We're on a foundation that is sure in Jesus Christ. And there is no other foundation that we can walk upon. There's no other foundation that we can build upon this morning than him. I'm glad this morning. You know, you people think, oh, I've heard everything that you want to hear about the Bible. I've probably heard it in, in my lifetime. And people have told me, oh, God, you know, men wrote the word. And, you know, God used men to write the word, yes. Now, are there errors in the word? I believe that this is the inherent uh, word of God, period. Uh, if you pull up a King James version of the Bible, you're going to find that there's some spellings in there that we don't spell like that anymore, but it's just the language of the day. That's not an error in the word. It's just how we spell things, and, that, and that's what we find. We find that the Old Testament was translated out of, out of the Aramaic. We find that the, the New Testament was, is, was translated out of the Greek. So I mean, there's going to be some different spelling pronunciations in that. But yet here we are. The Word of God is still sure. The Word of God is still perfect. The Word of God still saves souls. The Word of God still points us to a God who created everything. The Word of God still changes us, molds us, and makes us better than what we ever thought we could be. You look at me, you don't see the goodness of Ronnie Smith. You don't see that this morning. When you look at me and you see any goodness at all, you're looking at it because of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's because of the work that he's done in me. It's not anything that I have done or ever could do. I, I wouldn't be anything. I would be a wretched, awful, ugly sinner if it had not been by the mercies of Almighty God. I would be vile. I would be wicked. I would be undone. But by the blood of Jesus this morning, I, I've been saved. I've been washed in his hand. I'm able to walk a Christian life, not because of anything I have done, but because of his grace, because of his power, because of his mercy. I can walk in newness of life this morning. Amen. Oh, that rock that we have in Jesus. I like what the Amplified Version says of that same sentence or in Corinthians. It says, let me back up just so I get ahead of myself. 1 Corinthians 3, chapter 6, uh, verse 6 tells us, he talks about, it said, Apollos water. He said, he said, I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. <clears throat> so neither is he that plants anything, neither he that waters, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that plants, he that waters are one. But he also says this, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Another builds thereon, but let every man take heed how he builds thereupon, for no other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. The Amplified Version says this, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is already laid which is Jesus Christ. He's the foundation. Yes. He's the firm foundation this morning. The second point I want to make to you this morning, it, it tells us, it says that hell shall not prevail against the church. Matthew 16 and 18 there, Jesus said the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know, I thought about this. This may sound a little humorous, but oh, it's good. I, I love it when God wins, don't you? 
If Satan thought he had taken care of Jesus on the cross, he sure came up empty, didn't he? <laughs> didn't he come up empty? He didn't. He wasn't able to do it. Don't you just suppose? I believe I, this is my imagination this morning, and and sometimes I'm not. Re I wish I had the, the mind of, of some storytellers. That we've got some preachers that are great storytellers. But my mind doesn't. My imagination goes just a little bit, but not as deep as some of these great storyteller preachers that we do have. But don't you just suppose after Jesus arose from the dead? That the devil kept, kept kind of a low profile for a while, don't you reckon? I can imagine that dude slinking around, sneaking around. But he was like, what is next? What is next? But then, if you, if you can imagine with me, Jesus ascends back to the Father and they see him go. And, and you know, God has to use angels to direct those men that were standing, gazing, looking up into the heavens and Hey, you know, why are you standing? Hello? You, you, you ever done that to people sometimes? Hello? That's what the, that's the angels were saying. Hello? It's time. Why are you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus that you see go away, in like manner, he's coming back. Yeah. Yes. Amen. He's coming back. And, yeah. and this, is, this is what we look at this morning. And when he saw that, I believe the devil said, oh, now's my time to go back and make a mess of things. And I believe he, he tried his best. But again, Satan was surprised. Because the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, we find that the Holy Ghost, the Spirit, fell upon those 120 believers that were in the upper room. And don't you imagine, can you imagine how the devil felt when Peter gets up there and begins to preach after the day of Pentecost? Don't you imagine? He goes, oh, man. Now, 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 could you imagine with the other apostles that began to preach and, and teach in Jesus' name? Don't you imagine? He thought, he, he was going around thinking, I thought I had this thing lit. I thought this thing was going to end. And I thought this was going to stop, but, but it's going to keep on going. And guess what? It's kept on growing. And we're still here this morning. And we're pe preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're preaching the gospel of him crucified and, and risen again. That He his blood was shed so that we could be redeemed and forgiven of our sins. And we can walk in fellowship with God. We're still preaching the cross. We're still preaching Jesus this morning and it's worldwide Amen. we're still preaching and the devil hasn't stopped it the Bible says that, that Jesus said hell shall not prevail against the church Jesus told us he said I will not leave you comfortless I will come to you yet a little while he said the world sees me no more but you see me and he said because I live you shall live also because I live you shall live also Jesus told his disciples this he said I'm going to die but in three days I'm going to live and he proceeds to tell him, because I live, you shall live too. And this wasn't just talking about something to look forward to after death. I believe that we as the church of the living God can walk in newness of life in the power of the Spirit. And we are alive today. We're not dead in sin and trespasses. We're not walking in death, the, the sickness of this old world. But we're alive this morning. Yes. We've got joy in our heart. We've got peace in our mind. We walk in the fellowship of Christ Jesus. Amen. This morning. And we can be happy. We don't have to be like the world. If we get like the world. I, I, I've done it. I'm not proud of it this morning. But God's been showing me a lot of things in the last few years. He showed me a lot of things. There, there's times that. You know, I could complain and belly up with the best of them, you know. And we get into that mode sometimes. Sometimes it's easy to slip up and we get aggravated, discouraged, disappointed. And we, we begin to complain. We begin to murmur. But I think at that point we're forgetting who we serve. 
I think at that point we forget that we serve a God that can get us out of the junk. We, got, we serve a God that can take us from this point to the next point. And even if we walk through troubles and trials, he can see us home. We don't understand sometimes. I've heard a lot of this here lately. People don't understand why people suffer and go through hard times and go through struggles and go through hurts and pains. We're living in a world that's imperfect. But we serve a God that can get us through, us, through it all. Do it all. One last thought on this, this from the words of Jesus. Think about this. The gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. Now how much, how, how much the devil wants to silence us, hurt us, shut us up, divide us. He's tried all that. He's done all that. Cause division, cause pain, cause suffering, cause harm. He wants to do that. He wants to kid you. The church is still moving on. But Jesus said this, when the 70 returned, that he gave them power to go out and heal the sick and cast out demons and, and do all these works and preach the, 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 the gospel. They came back and they were so excited, but Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And that, that stuck with me just for a moment. This morning, if you think the devil has power against us humanly, if we're going after the devil and our own power, you better look out for some trouble. Amen. But if you walk in the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus covers your sins, yes. the devil has no power over you. I, if you Google this, you know, everybody Googles stuff nowadays, you know. So I had to Google something. How fast is a lightning bolt? The answer that was given, I think, was a little wrong. But uh, it's there if you want to Google it. It said 270,000 miles per hour. However, I found the site that's, hopefully they know more about it than the first answer that pulled up. But I went to NASA, and they give us a figure of 186,000 Miles per second. 186,000 miles per second. And I want you to just think. You think that the devil has power over God? <laughs> Look how fast he slid out of heaven. 186,000 miles a second. He was cast down to the earth. we ever get to the point when the devil thinks he's got the upper hand, we need to remind him of the God that we serve. Yes. We need to remind him of the power that God has over him. Then, you know, when Jesus even walked the earth, there was demons that said, you know, hey, Jesus, what are you going to do? Throw us out before the time? They were afraid of Jesus. They weren't up in his face. Oh, I know y'all get tired of me saying this, but one of my biggest uh, thing, and I, if I even say it right, my girls used to laugh at me, but a, a meme, I think it is, on Facebook, you know, sometimes they show the devil and the Jesus arm wrestling. And that aggravates me. Because my Jesus don't have to arm wrestle the devil. My Jesus just has to do like he did Legion over there in the garden or the tombs of Gadara. And he just has to say, go. And at the word go, the demons had to flee. So 2,000 demons got in a bunch of hogs, and, and they were all choked in the water. Amen. That's how powerful our God is. I believe the church needs to realize this morning that we serve a God who is greater than anything the world has for us. Yes, we're going to be fought. Yes, the, the, the devil and his demons and his imps are going to fight the church tooth and nail. But we have power in the name of Jesus Christ over all demon authority and power. We have power by the blood of Jesus. It's not in my name. I'm not going to come at no devil and tell them that Ronnie Smith wants you to go because they're going to laugh in my face. But in the name of Jesus Christ, they're going to have to leave. The last point I want to make to you this morning is the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, I'll give you the keys 
of the kingdom of heaven. And this is the spot here this morning. We just need to stop and, and think about it this morning. Are we really using the keys that Christ has left us with? In Matthew 16, 19, he said, I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, thou sh in, in, on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Commentary tells us that rabbis used the terms bind and loose to refer to whether something was permissible or not according to the law. got me to thinking about this this morning. What do we allow the devil to do to us? Think about it. What do we allow him to do to us when we, when we should be saying that's not permissible? I'm covered by the blood. When he comes to tempt us, when he comes to try us, when we, we're having a, a all sorts of trials and tribulation, even sickness in our body. What do we say? That's not permissible. I, I don't believe that uh, this morning that nothing we do or say should be out of God's will. That's the key this morning. I was thinking about this. At some point in our lives, Maybe our adult lives, maybe our young life, I don't know, but we've taken a hold of a set of keys, haven't we? I find it hard this morning to tell you that the truck that I have now has a push button. And I look for a set of keys to start the engine. And where you could used to turn the accessory on and you could listen to the radio without running your truck, I don't know how you would do that on a push button thing. I don't know if you can. I don't like that, <laughs> actually. But we've taken hold of a set of keys, have we not? Whether it was for a mode of transportation or place of dwelling or even a, at a place of employment, we've taken keys with those keys, each of us took possession. It gave us a responsibility to take care of it. You with me this morning? Amen. There's a responsibility to having a home. There's a responsibility to, to having an automobile. There's a, there was a responsibility if, if your, your employer give you a key. There's, you got a responsibility. That you're going to do what's right. You're going to take care of things. Each of those possessions, that responsibility that we have, whether it's to oversee or to dwell or to abide in that space, we have to do the same with what God has given us. He's given us of His Spirit. He's given us his blood to cover our sins. And we don't walk carelessly or clumsily along in life without getting in the word, without getting in prayer, and maintaining what God has given us. For he has made his abode. The Bible says when he comes in, he makes his abode in our hearts. And we're to, we're to take care of that dwelling. We're to take care of that space. So that we don't get into trouble. I like what uh, the writer of Acts put here. It says, for in him we live and we move and we have our being as certain also of our own poets have said. For we are also his offspring. <coughs> and in closing this morning, I want us to think of the kingdom of heaven. The keys to the kingdom of heaven. 1 John 5 and 13 says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Amen. He hears us. Church, when we cry out and ask God to forgive us of our sins, he hears us. Yeah. That's his will. 
That's his will to save. That's what he came to do, to seek and to save the lost, to forgive. He hears. There's a lot of prosperity preachers in our land. I, I guess probably only in America would that happen. All oh, they preach that God is going to bless you financially. But you know, I don't see one thing in the scriptures that tells us that all his children are going to be multimillionaires or billionaires. You know why that's not the case? Because some may take that multimillionaire and that billionaire status and, and they forget about the God that saved them. I never will forget all my all my life. I know Jan can attest to this, but I don't know how many times I heard, you know, Elvis would have been a better my daddy would say Elvis would be a would have better would have been better off if he'd have stayed a poor boy. Yeah. I heard that I don't know how many times. Because what came about, the fame, the fortune, and the drugs, everything else, it killed him. Yeah. It destroyed him. But Christ came to give us life this morning. And you know what? This morning, if we if our focus is on millionaires and billionaires, we're missing the greatest wealth that you could ever find in this earth, Amen. and that's Jesus Christ. Yes. You know, I, I, I preached here just a little while back. We did a study on Wednesday night talking about the glories of, of the heavenly city, the New Jerusalem, and all the adornments and all the, you know the gates of pearl. A solid pearl, the streets of gold, the, the, like transparent glass. All these things that we value here on earth are going to be what makes up the material up there. But nobody's going to want it. Nobody's going to steal it. Nobody's going to graffiti over it because it doesn't mean anything to them. Because the real treasure of heaven is Jesus. Amen. The real treasure up there is going to be with the Lord. And I think that most people would find, whether we're poor or rich, the greatest treasure you'll ever find on this earth is Jesus. Amen. So this morning, I tell you, hold on to Jesus. Who do you say that he is?